Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Today on the show is Rick Edler. Rick is the president and CEO of Sotheby's Manhattan Redondo South Bay and oversees all operations of the business. He was named Realtor of the Year in 2009 by Realtor Magazine, and last year he did $53 million in sales volume, earning him the rank of number 240 in Wall Street Journal's list of top producing agents. Hey, Rick, thanks for taking the time out today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So I, I've given a brief overview of your background, but maybe take a minute and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Okay. Um, I started in 1991 at uh, request of my mom, who knew I was being a beach bum living in Manhattan Beach and not exactly doing much uh, as far as my career. Uh, at the time, technology was starting to feed into real estate, and she said, oh, it would be a good time to get your real estate license and practice. Since it's easier to go along with your mom than argue with your mom, I got my real estate license and started working around with her for a bit. I uh, did that for a couple years, not really taking it seriously, just kind of plugging along, tried a little bit of what I call resumercials and commercial residential kind of both together. 1996, I met a gentleman by the name of Ron Garber out of Tustin in Orange County. He was doing a phenomenal amount of business. He was doing 250 to 300 transactions a year. He was had a whole team. He was treating it like a real business. He had buyer's agents. He had listing agents. He was a whole team before people were teams. And it kind of fired me up as the way to do this business, to grow it, and to really treat it like a real successful business. I uh, shadowed him for a while, learned a lot of uh, things to do and not do, and uh, ever since then, we've been uh, growing and plugging along pretty good. Um, we built up a team uh, in about 2001. Um, I had a situation where I walked into a doctor's office, and I recognized a person in the office as somebody who I, I recognize, you know, kind of. I tend to joke that I reminisce with people I don't know. I just kind of, oh, I know this person, so I start talking to them. Uh, halfway through the conversation, I realized that they had bought a house with one of our buyer's agents, and I actually really didn't know much about them at all. That was kind of my um, reality to the fact that I had built up a fairly large, successful real estate team, but I had really distanced myself from what I felt was this business and why I got into it, which was more connecting with people. So I was more managing people and operations than I was building or practicing in real estate. Um, basically that year we disbanded the team. Instead of being all things to all people, we decided we're going to be all things to a few select people. We're going to focus on raising our average sale price. We're going to focus on raising our average commission, but we're going to provide a lot more resources and tools and personal attention for less clients. Um, I wouldn't say it's my Jerry Maguire moment, but that was kind of where we went from trying to be the top team with the biggest numbers to walk across the stage with the most awards to being the most important client, um, most important agent to a few specific people. Um, that was uh, 2001, 2002. And since then, we've uh, kind of continued that direction. We are a small office. We have uh, 47 agents in our office. And within that, I also operate with a team with uh, my partner, Darren, my other partner, who's Kitty, who also happens to be my mom. But when we're in the office, I call her Kitty. And uh, we've been pretty successful in the South Bay. Um, successful, as I define it, is basically having good clients, repeat business, and it's able to afford the lifestyle, which uh, which we can enjoy the, uh, the fruits of our labor. That's a little dummy. Oh, my gosh. you That was the best background ever. You literally covered... Half my questions in that in that intro. So, but we're gonna we're I'm gonna have to ask you them anyway. So, you were a beach bum. Yes. Uh, you you got your license at the behest of your mother, and you 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 played around a little bit, um, and uh, you kind of had an aha moment uh, when you shouted. Is his name Garber? Ryan Garber. Yes. Okay. 
Um, and at that time, he was doing something different than most people were. He was actually treating this like a real business. So you've, you've, you, you've seen, and your mom's been in the business, so you've been around a long time. You've seen a lot of things. What do you think the biggest hurdle real estate entrepreneurs have to overcome to be successful? I think the biggest entrepreneurs, when you mention real estate entrepreneurs, that tells me an agent getting into this business, not necessarily somebody who's been in it many years. So I say an entrepreneur into this business is somebody says, okay, real estate's something I want to do and they want to jump in. The biggest mistake I see them make is just like taking the driver's test and being able to drive Getting your real estate license has nothing to do with practicing real estate. Too many people get the uh, the license and then they run out and say, okay, I can wing it, show some people some property. It's not um, hard, hard work, but it's not what the public or Hollywood projects, in my opinion, what real estate is. Real estate is a lot more of a people interaction, finding out people's needs and then fixing that model, fixing their desires than it is simply just buying and selling real estate. The negotiation is just one part of it. Showing property is just one part of it. Understanding the dynamics between a husband and a wife and their needs is one part of it. Understanding the complexities of a contract is one part of it. You put all these pieces together and it creates kind of a, a, an interesting picture that somebody who just steps to the table does not see all the complexities of it and assumes running in that it's an easy thing to do. So I find that most people who are entrepreneurs of it don't embrace the business that once you get your license that's just like okay now you get to learn how to drive you just have the right to learn how to drive and i would say most people getting into this business the single best thing they need to do is shadow follow spend as much time as they can with any agent who's successful and they respect doesn't have to be a top performing agent that gets ranked on real trends or any particular report but somebody in their market that they like and that they can say hey that person's business is similar to the way i would do business and learn the the, the bolts of it um i was fortunate enough i was able to learn a lot of that from having my mom in the business so i kind of got a, a jump start but i see a lot of people who jump into this and they just they need a shadow. And even for me, who had my mom, who was very successful when I joined this, um, I would take your garbage can leads, leads you just didn't want to return the phone calls, and I would take those. It wasn't until I met Ron and I got a different perspective of how to run this that it kind of opened up my eyes the way it does, and I watched the way he did things. Some of it works for me. Some of it doesn't. I mean, some of it is not at all like me. It's like trying on a shirt that doesn't fit, but sometimes it does. So for him to open up my eyes, and it was very, I mean, when I think back, what a wonderful gift it was for me to have somebody just kind of open up their whole business and share what they were doing so that I could learn from it and take what I wanted. Anytime I have an opportunity, someone knocks on my door and says, hey, I'm thinking about getting into the business. Uh, can you give me some information about it? I feel indebted that I need to share that too. So yeah, spend a day with me. See what you think. You may like it. You may not. There's so many different facets of real estate. It could be leasing. It could be residential. It could be commercial. It could be industrial. It could be tenant rep. Who knows? But you need to spend time with people who have businesses that you want to emulate too and then follow in their footsteps and don't forget to give back and thank somebody else for that. But that's really the way entrepreneurs need to step into this business and be successful in it, in my opinion, because it's worked for me that way. I will tell you that I hear that often, right? Go out and Good. find a mentor, find a coach, find somebody you can learn from. Uh, because, you know, it, as a new agent, uh, and you picked up on that quickly when I said real estate on, entrepreneur um, and what that meant. But so, you know, you get your license, you go out there, and then there's a whole bucket of stuff you have to deal with. As you mentioned, right? You have negotiation, you have contract issues, you have husband and wife dynamics. And, and once you start to get in there, uh, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. You can't, you know, you, you don't know what is the most important thing at that time. Um, yeah. How do you do that? I mean, you, you gave some good tips. You said, hey, it doesn't need to be a top performing agent as, you know, and listed on real trends. Um, uh, and you guys, so I would say, you know, so somebody like you, you, you are a, uh, a college coach and there's, there's other guys who might be, uh, you know, NBA coaches. Um, but then there's the high school coach that, that, these people can learn from uh, how, how do they go about tell me how as a new agent how do I go and find a mentor and how do I incent that person to work with me well I think the the first thing is you go into a market that you like or that you have passion for whether it's your own market or another market you're moving towards and you kind of go out and you meet them 
whether you meet them at an open house, whether you meet them at their office, whether you meet them just by reputation, whether you ask around, there are certain agents who kind of move to a level of uh, uh, respect in their neighborhood, if you will. Um, those are the people you knock on the door, you ask them if you can buy them lunch or coffee to pick their brain. And you find out. It might take you one coffee, you meet the person, you're ready to go. It might take you 100 coffees. One other way I think would be really helpful is if you met with, in our market in California, we have title and we have escrow officers. I see my title officer every day. I ask him questions about other things than simply just real estate title. When people come in to say, hey, I want to learn about real estate, I'm like, the best resource is to take a title officer out to dinner, take him out to lunch, ask them. They meet with They get a pulse on the market that we don't. And their view of everything is slightly different. They also want to build a relationship because when that person becomes successful in this business, they're going to need a title person, mm. and you've built a rapport that way. Right. Same with S. Mm. These people who are already successful in support structures for real estate get to know them. They probably know the agent who comes in and says, hey, you know what, I'm thinking about retiring in two years. And they go, hey, it's funny, I just met with somebody who is looking at getting in. Go put the connection together. And if you don't ask, you won't know. Great advice. Um, so for you, you know, you obviously have been uh, have been super successful. Um, was there ever a time for you when you felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And, and how did you push through that roadblock and find success? Well, the answer is yes. There's numerous times I've wanted to quit. And it's typically when it's the close friend, it's the person you've done the most hard work to when they turn around and they won't say stab you in the back, but they throw you under the bus. When you work really, really hard for a friend and they turn around and say, well, I'm going to use so-and-so because I felt sorry for them and they need the money. And you're like, what, what, what is it? Was my service not good enough? Um, I think that's hard for me. I take it personally and wear it on the sleeve. Um, I think there's a certain dynamic I have that when somebody will attack my mom, I become defensive as a son yeah. before a partner first. I think she does the same. So we sometimes have to kind of condition each other. It's a personal business. Half the time, there's a lot of emotions that get involved, and it's hard to distance that. That can wear you down. I find that, again, having kind of the support structure of people who are in slightly different businesses helps me through that. But there's just, there's just tough times. My wife is not in the business, and that's by choice. I mean, we kind of joke that she could go get a real estate license to help me out, but the reality is we need a separation of church and state. Right. And having, having be able to come home and – I'll share something with her, and she'll look at it from a completely different point of view and say, well, of course they would have done that because of this. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't see it. I need that kind of checks and balance. If you don't have somebody that kind of gives you a different perspective sometimes, it can really beat you up. I have to honestly say um, meditation has actually been something I've brought into my uh, my life in the last couple of years that's really helped me out. I get so sucked into the work and the day that just to carve 15 minutes out to go find a quiet moment in the sun and just – meditate and have things come to me and quiet my mind has been a tremendous resource. And five years ago, if you offered that to me, I would have kind of looked at you like you had three eyes and just gone, that's kind of a really weird, uh, fuzzy position. But now I see that as a, a really good resource for me. You, you know, and that's another thing I hear often, right? Is, I mean, a lot of you super agents out there have a regimen of, I mean, you're the first meditation person we've had on here, but but everybody else they they definitely uh, uh, try to keep their their mind and body healthy uh, by working right. out. They they really take care of themselves. Um, well, f what do you think is the single biggest thing that most realtors just get wrong? I, I think that was what I mentioned earlier about just jumping into the business, getting a license, and assuming that's all about just solving the couple problems in front of people, or, or expecting there's a silver bullet that solves everything. Right. The, 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 you need to spend time just to kind of learn the different techniques. I'm a different agent than I was a year ago. I'm a different agent than I was five years ago. I'll be a different agent next year. All this is an ongoing process, and being able to share that with somebody else and have other people give guidance to you I think is really helpful, and you only do that when you interact with other people. How, so you, that's interesting. Uh, you're a different agent today than you were last year. You're a different agent than you were five years ago. Um, how so? Well, how, how is it your outlook, or what? What is different? I mean, well, I, tell me about that growth. Um, okay, so it's. 
I had a, I've had a, a personal coach. I've had a professional coach. I've had people who have kind of called me or called BS on things I've done. I get comfortable in my routines, and sometimes I need to get shaken up. Um, I need somebody to hold me accountable. I also need somebody to be able to share and talk with and kind of give a, a – who's connected to this industry that understands it but also has a different perspective on it. That's where the title – that's where the lending – that's where the – different people who are within the network, but not necessarily a competitor, can be a good resource, going out to lunch with them and talking, sharing the issues, and then having them give feedback to it. Um, I know one of the things that changed for me was I lost a listing presentation in 2007, and I came out of it, and I was talking to a buddy of mine, and he, we were saying, why didn't I get in? I went in, and I was explaining to him what I did right, what I did wrong, duh, duh, and he's like, you didn't go in to win. You went in not to lose. Hmm. And that perspective was a very different perspective. I didn't go in with both guns blazing. I didn't want another agent to have it. But I didn't want another agent to have it. It was more important to me than me getting that listing. So I stepped back and said, okay, my listing presentation has gotten canned. My listing presentation I can do in an hour. And if I can't do it in an hour, I'd start getting stressed. What is it about my listing presentation that is missing the mark? How do I improve it? How do I change it? And um, I got a coach in there. He helped me out for a little bit. And I repositioned my entire presentation. I went from having a, this is what I can do for you, to my first question. Typically, it's my first question. I sometimes build a little rapport first, but my question I get to is, what is their biggest concern? And now that drives my entire process. The listing presentation and the buyer's presentation is down to what is your biggest concern. And by getting that specific answer, I know how to tailor the rest of my presentation, both with buyers or with sellers, because now I'm addressing what their needs are, not what I have to sell. What is their biggest And I wrote that down earlier. You said find their needs. Um, Finding their needs, are those two things different or are they the same? Their concerns and their needs? Their needs, but their biggest concern, they may tell you their biggest, they might say, you know, I need to sell this at top dollar and I need to, uh, I only want to pay 5% commission total. And you get into what's their biggest concern. Their biggest concern is not being able to make their job transfer so that they're operational in Chicago in six weeks. Their biggest mm. concern might be that it sits on the market for 90 days and their neighbors find out about it. Their biggest concern might be the fact that, that people find out that the reason they're selling is they're getting divorced. The real reasons are the ones you need to speak to, not the initial ones that they tell you or fill out on a form. Brilliant. That is great. Well, for you, tell, tell us about your first breakthrough do, deal or that first aha moment that you had. I think the first aha moment was that realization that I needed to ask the question of what's important to them, what's their biggest concern. Because anytime I get stuck now, that's the question I go to. What is your biggest concern? And go back to that. It's a mutual objective. That was an aha moment for me. It also gives me comfort level that if I get into a sticky situation and I don't know where it's going, I go back to, okay, what is our biggest concern? What do we need to go to? I even use it with my kids now. That, I'd say, would be more of an aha moment than a big breakthrough deal or a big a breakthrough transaction. I can tell you the most memorable sales I had, and they're typically dealing with clients who are in very specifically challenging situations on a personal level and needed a lot of attention and love, and I was able to provide that for them, and they have reiterated numerous times how much they appreciated that. That was the moment I'm most proud of. But I think the Eureka, the, the moment that had a breakthrough for me that changed my business was switching from what I was selling them to finding out what their needs really are, their biggest concern. I love that. I, you know, and I'll tell you, I'm going to start using that on my wife and kids. What's your biggest concern? But And I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about that. I was thinking I have a, I have a daughter that is in sixth grade. She just went to, to middle school. She's having a hard time with it. Um, if I asked her that, I don't know that she could answer that. And I, and you know, how do you, I'm sure that you ask that of your clients and they may not know how to answer that, or they may give you an answer. That's not quite the truth. How do you, how do you dig in there and, and really uncover it? And how do you know when you did uncover it? Well, you go through what I call three deep. You ask, why is that? Why is that? Oh. Why is that? Why is you having a big concern? Well, so-and-so is doing this. Why is that important to you? Because of this, why is that important? If you dig three times, you'll cover what is usually down there. The first one might be the answer that they've told themselves, but the third answer is really what the true core reason is. That is great. And I'll tell you, anybody there out there in the audience, uh, if you can find a coach like Rick, I think I think you'd be successful. 
Well, you know, you you may have touched on this earlier, but let me let me ask it. You know, what do you know now that you wished you would have known when you started? Um, to say no. To say no. I think to say no. Too many, often we jump for the latest client, the next showing, the next opportunity. There's always a, a something to do. We're people, people. We want to please people. We're always out there trying to do our best. But sometimes the, if it's outside of your expertise, you got to say no. Um, there was a story about a paramedics, and they arrive at the scene, and it's very chaotic and crazy, and there's lots of noise going on. They get out. They assess the scene. One guy goes and gets his gear. The other guy goes and assess who needs help first. There's chaos around them, but they operate at their speed. They know that no matter the person yelling at them may be the person that doesn't need the most attention, but the person who can't yell needs the most. That lesson I try to pull into my life, say, okay, I know what's best for my client. Even sometimes they may not. I know what's best for me on how to operate. I can't become victim to other people's schedules and other people's speeds because that jeopardizes what I'm actually here to do. And I try to remember that lesson when I go through and get everything going forward and help people out. But I find that that message of being able to say no to things that you really don't want to do frees you up on time and also allows you to do what you do best. Oh, man. Yeah, that's another good one. I have a, I, I have a problem with that. I, I want to say yes to everybody, and I, I sometimes I find myself in situations or deals even that I'm like, ah, I really don't want to – I shouldn't have said yes to this. But So for you, you so, and that's a skill. Learning how to say no is definitely a skill that you have to, that you have to grow. On a day-to-day basis, you know, how do you stay productive and focused on, on, on the things that you do need to stay focused on? Typically, I start the day with a list of dollar productive activities, not to do, but things that are the best dollar productive activities that actually generate return. Then I have a list of things that I need to get to that day, but may not be as critical. And then I have a list of also things to stop doing, things that I can delegate out or that I shouldn't be doing every day so that I can kind of think like, you know what, I shouldn't be dealing with this. I can get somebody else who's doing this. Good example of accounting, I am a disaster at accounting. I would pay all the money I could to have someone else do it all for me. But I still find myself spending countless hours trying to organize it or learn QuickBooks. And the reality is, is I'll never get good at that. So I always say, okay, who can I get off my plate? Who can I have that takes this off my plate and does this for me? Gives me a report once a week so I know where everything stands so I can get the information out of it, but I don't have to become the best accountant out there because I never will be. Right. Um, so in terms of the first thing you said was dollar productive. Uh, can you tell us some of the things that you did today that were dollar productive for you? Uh, meeting with a buyer, meeting with a seller, writing up contracts. Anything that does that is dollar productive. Everything else needs to either lead to that or it's not dollar productive. Perfect. I don't make money sitting in my office playing video games, bottom line. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. For you, Rick, can you tell us one thing that is working for you in your business right now? Uh, one thing is, oh, that's an interesting question. What's the best thing that's working for me in my business right now? Um, I think asking for referrals. It's really hard for me to talk to a client at the end of a transaction and really ask them, is there anybody I can provide service to? Is there anything I could have done better for you? Asking for the feedback and asking for referrals has been a really hard transition for me. I kind of expect people will naturally like, hey, you did a great job. Let me refer you to somebody. But I think that's been really what's been helpful for me to help build my business is asking for referrals at the end. Um, that's been good. That's been, my, I think, the change in the last couple of years that's helped my business. Why, why is that hard for you? I guess I just expect people to, yeah. if you do a good job, that they're going to return the favor. Yeah. But people don't do it unless you ask for it. Um, speaking of feedback, so... Uh, how, let's talk about Zillow and Trulia, the online tools. You know, how, how do you think those sites like that have changed the way that buyers, sellers, and agents interact? How, how's that dynamic been altered? Well, Zillow and Trulia are trying to get the sellers and the buyers, trying to get their consumer to interact with the agent and having them as the inner source between the two, and I think that's a mistake. They're hmm. in the business of sell advertising. Um, I don't focus on Zillow or Trulia. I find in the higher end market, which we're at, it, they seem to have more inaccurate information than accurate information. I find that they create so much noise that most people um, in my market don't rely on it. But it's a resource that everybody's using. They're what capitalized at $3 billion and $1 billion. They're serious uh, players in this market. 
they are going to get it right. They are going to tweak it, and they're going to be an integral part of the business. So at this point, I don't put a lot of energy or time into Zillow or Trulia, but I do update my profile with them, and I do update my information with them. I do report the solds with them because I know that more and more consumers are going to that. They're not going away. They're not a fad. Um, I find that having that much information out there actually makes us more desirable because people get all this information they don't know what to rely on. So then they turn around and they actually need an agent to help interpret it for them. Um, so uh, when I was doing research for this interview, I, I, I Googled your name in all sorts of different ways. And what, what I found was interesting uh, and this is this is kind of common with with people that, that, as successful as you. You're everywhere. Your 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 profile is in a lot of different places, but but your profile is relatively empty, uh, except for your name and then uh, maybe a phone number. There's there's not much else there. Is that is that a conscious thing? Uh, do do you not use social media, or or is that just accidental? Um, it's a conscious thing. Um, Privacy and trust is very important with my clients, hmm. so I'm careful what information I put out there. I want people to you know, find me quickly, but I don't want people to necessarily know too much about me without having some interaction. So do you use social media, or, or, or does your business use social media at all? Facebook, Twitter? We do on a very, very small basis. Interesting. Um, this is kind of a kooky question, but I, I, I like it. Um, I get sometimes good stuff out of it. What is something I didn't ask, but I should have asked you? I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think a good question that you would have asked is if I had to do over again, would I do the same thing? Would I pick the same career? And the answer would be yes. If I had to do over again, I think I would have been more focused on clients in the beginning that I – wanted to work with versus in trying to reach a level to get an award or come across the stage to reach a certain point that seemed to only matter that second when I walked across and afterwards nobody else seemed to care. Right. Um, I think that would have been the difference I would have had in this, but I would have picked the same path and the same career that I have now. You know, um, uh, per my question list that I, that I sent you, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to go into the ask the agent round, but I, I want to talk about team building. That's something that you saw – uh, Garber do really well. Um, uh, tell me about how you built your team and, and the most important pieces of that. The most important part of my team is Erica, who happens to end up being my cousin. Hmm. But most of the people on our team actually ended up being clients who liked working with us, who eventually became part of our team. Wow. We ended up recruiting people through Craigslist and through different sources, but the true people that ended up being the best part team members were ones who were clients at one point. So what, what does Erica do for you? Erica is basically the hub of our wheel. She manages the office. She manages our operations. She keeps me on track. She manages my schedule. I gave up my schedule to her a long time ago, and that was, gave me a lot of freedom and control and also an easier ability to say no. She manages our clients. She manages transaction files. The marketing is done by another individual, Kit, and she is, reports to Erica, so everything goes through Erica to get it handled. One point of contact, um, one point of person that knows what's going on. She stays in the office because we're always mobile. Um, I'll sometimes come home, and I won't see my mom for two or three days. Just be, Even though we have offices next to each other, just our schedules are very different. But Erica stays at one point, and she's the point of contact for everybody. Wow. Um, uh, you, you mentioned marketing. Where, where do you – what does what your marketing program look like? Marketing is simple website stuff. Hmm. We do a lot of stuff on YouTube and videos. Hmm. We will do uh, everything we do. We do in color. We do print. We do. We still do um, just listed, just sold, um, newly introduced, uh, recently acquired. We do brochures. We do print. Everything we do, we do high end color. We do high end glossy, and we do when we do advertising in magazines, we do that all in color as well. Well, so for everybody out in the audience, uh, to to if you want to find this, uh, it's superagentslive.com/slash Rick Adler. Um, we are now at Ask the Agent Round. This is where I fire off questions and you come back at us with answers that will help each of our audience members move the needle in their business. If okay. you could recommend only one book, what would it be? Sell the Feeling, Larry Pincy. Do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with and you can share with our audience? Agent Bridge. Agent Bridge. D take a, a, a second and talk about that. 
Bridge.com is an, a system that allows you on the website to interact with other agents and share pockets and potential listings with other high-end um, agents. Love it. Do you have any personal habits other than meditation that have contributed to your success? I do yoga. Um, I have every morning before I go to the office, before I check my emails, I go to Starbucks, I have a, my iced coffee and I have a everything bagel toasted with cream cheese sometimes I don't even drink the coffee or eat the whole bagel but just the process of kind of getting into the mode to start the day and then once I'm on game on the day starts and at the end of the day when I go home I close the door I keep my phone on but I explain to people that the only time I'm going to take a situation after 6 p.m. is if it's an active buyer active seller negotiations of a contract or basically something that close to 911 otherwise I have to refocus and uh, recharge for the next day Oh, man, I love that. I love that. Uh, t- too many agents treat this like a 24-7 business. And it's just, uh, I-, I love putting, uh, you know, having a daily routine like that as well as putting some boundaries. Yep. What are the first three steps a new agent should do to begin building his business in the next 10 days? Pick a market they want to master. Pick a mentor or somebody they can shadow. And pick a routine and stick to it. Great. Well, give us one piece of parting advice and let us know where we can find you and we'll sign off. Um, do what you love. It comes through if you do it. And okay. Thank you. Where can we find you? Uh, you can reach me on my cell, 310-872-4333 or rick at edlergroup.com, E-D-L-E-R-G-R-O-U-P.com. My website's also edlergroup.com. I will tell you, Rick, this is absolutely uh, top 10 interviews, and, and we've had some great people on here. So I really appreciate you coming on. I, I, I know our audience has probably written two pages of notes. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll send you a link as soon as this thing goes live. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you heard it, folks. That was Rick Edler on why you should find your clients' needs and solve them. And he was nice enough to share his method to do that. He asked them, what's your biggest concern? And then he asked them again. Rick is a huge proponent of finding a mentor as well as seeking out and finding the clients that he wants to work with. You know, his business started taking off when he decided that he's not going to be all things to all people. Rick shared with us that he struggles with asking for referrals and feedback. Is that something you maybe can do better? Well, I hope that you can take one thing away from this interview and implement it in your business today. If you've enjoyed this session as much as I have, please go to iTunes subscribe and give us a rating and review. I know I keep asking for this, but as a new podcast, all iTunes cares about is how many ratings and reviews we have. And if we can get enough, iTunes will feature us and then we can continue bringing you these free coaching sessions. Help us grow this audience and tell your friends. It would really mean a lot to us here at the show. Until next time, I am Toby Salgado and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. Let's go!